Good evening and welcome wherever you are across New Zealand. And if you happen to be watching from Australia, very good afternoon to you. My name is Brett Ayres and on behalf of the Canon Medical Team, it's great to have you along with us for this presentation with Andrew Grant on hamstring MSK ultrasound. I've also got Fran Lowry with me. Hello, Fran. Um, and we're going to be um, doing a presentation today with Andrew and also too, we're going to be doing some live questions and answers at the end of it. Just a quick bit of housekeeping to know of is that with the live presentation right now, if you want CPD points, you need to be on for at least 40 minutes to receive them. But the good news is for everybody that registers is that you'll be receiving a video link um, replay of the whole webinar in the coming days. If you want to stay in touch with Canon Medical, then the easy thing to do is to get onto anz.medical.canon and you can see um, our education spot there and you can sign up to receive more notifications about events that we've got coming up. Just a quick word about Andrew Grant. Andrew Grant's a sonographer with over 30 years experience. He's also a very renowned ultrasound educator. He's the ultrasound supervisor of, of IMED Radiology in East Melbourne. That's where he'll be broadcasting from today. And also too, he's a sessional lecturer at the University of South Australia and CQU University, Central Queensland University um, in, in ultrasound subjects. Um, also two people would know him from uh, conferences where he speaks at, but also to um, say for the New, New Zealand people, last year he did our um, anatomy weekend with Stephen Bird, and um, so he's very well known to to you there. Um, to, speaking of 2023, it was a big year for Andrew Grant. He was also awarded the ASA Victorian Sonographer of the Year, which is a great achievement. Um, so we're very honoured to have Andrew presenting today, um, and it looks a really great program. Um, it's going to be on hamstring and ultrasound. So without any further ado. Um, we're going to get on with it. If you want to ask a question, you can type a question into the question box. Um, depending on what device you've got, it's either at the top, um, in the top right hand corner. Thanks very much for that introduction, Brett, and welcome everyone to this webinar. I would like to start by thanking Brett and Canon for inviting me to present this evening on hamstring ultrasound. The hamstring ultrasound is one of those scans that a lot of sonographers can be a bit apprehensive about. I know I used to be quite apprehensive about them. I knew the basic anatomy, but I always found it difficult to translate that knowledge into what I was seeing on the screen. So in this webinar, I want to show you a systematic way uh, to navigate around the hamstrings so that the theoretical anatomy knowledge that you have uh, will make a little bit more sense. Now, there are a few key landmark images that if you know what the anatomy is you are looking at and you have that well under your belt, you will find that navigation through the rest of the hamstrings just that little bit easier. Now, as with all ultrasound, uh, once you have a good grasp of the normal anatomy and the appearance of that normal anatomy, the recognition of the likely pathologies that you will encounter will also be made, hopefully, just that little bit easier as well. So the hamstring muscles are a group of muscles in the posterior thigh. They're made up of the semimembranosus, the semitendinosus, and the biceps femoris. Now the biceps femoris has uh, two heads. It has a long head and it has a short head. Now some people don't regard the short head as a true hamstring because it only crosses the knee joint. True hamstring should cross uh, two joints, both the hip joint and the knee joint. And as such, they act on both of these joints by extending the hip and by flexing the knee. Now, it's important to realize that not only do the hamstrings extend the hip and flex the knee, as I've said, but they also use during the extension. And to understand this, we need to be familiar with concentric and eccentric uh, contraction. Now, in this context, the word contraction doesn't mean shortening. It actually means activation. So in concentric contraction, uh, muscle activation results in the muscle becoming shorter. And in this case here, we can see on the diagram, uh, causing the flexion of the knee. Now with eccentric contraction, muscle activation will result in the muscle lengthening. And we can see that here when 
this mushroom goes a little bit uh, a different color there is. So that is eccentric contraction, and this is concentric contraction. Now, the reason why the hamstrings contract when the knee is extending is to reduce the velocity uh, at which this uh, lower leg um, extends. If the hamstring muscles were just to completely relax, then the lower leg will fall down with the, all the force of gravity uh, with such force it can actually damage uh, the knee joint itself. So the hamstrings uh, will activate, they will lengthen, and they will just slow this uh, progression of the leg as it extends. Now, you can imagine when someone is uh, walking, this concentric and eccentric contraction is alternating relatively slowly. But when someone is running, the hamstrings very quickly alternate between this concentric and the eccentric contraction. And this rapid alternation between the two is one of the reasons uh, why it is thought that the hamstrings are so prone uh, to tearing. Now, these hamstrings also have very long proximal and very distal uh, tendons. And as a result, they have very long musculotendinous junctions. And these extend well into the muscle bellies. I've got some uh, more slides coming in a bit later. Uh, but as you probably remember, the musculotendinous junction is probably the weakest part of uh, the whole complex. So by having such large, long musculotendinous junctions that extend well within the bellies of the muscle, uh, that's another reason it is thought that why the hamstrings are, um, are prone to uh, tearing and pathology. So let's have a look at each of these three muscles in a little bit more detail. So we'll start with the biceps femoris. Uh, the biceps uh, femoris has an origin uh, up here on the posterior medial ischial tuberosity, and it has a combined tendon, uh, which is known as a conjoint tendon, with the semitendinosus. So it's on the posterior medial aspect, so this part over here of the ischial tuberosity, and it uh, muscle then travels laterally and inserts all the way down into the head of the fibula, uh, which we can see here. Now, the first little landmark uh, is coming into play here. This is that the sciatic nerve uh, always is situated underneath the biceps femoris. So if you can find the sciatic nerve, you look directly above that, and that will be the long head of the biceps femoris. And the biceps femoris is innervated by the tibial nerve. Now, the short head of the biceps femoris is a little bit more anterior. We can see here a little bit more uh, deeper, as we'll have on the screen. Uh, it originates from this ridge at the back of the femur called the linear aspira, and it uh, travels down the lateral part of the lower thigh and inserts onto the head of the fibula uh, with this uh, long head here. And the short head is innervated by the common perineal nerve. Now, this dual innervation, one by the tibial nerve and one by the common perineal nerve, is uh, thought to be why there is a greater frequency of tears of the biceps femoris. Now this origin of the uh, biceps femoris short head here is also a good landmark for when you're describing uh, between the proximal hamstrings, which are these ones up here, and the distal hamstrings. So the proximal hamstrings really won't contain that short head of the biceps, whereas the distal hamstrings uh, will involve that short head of the biceps. So now we'll have a look at the uh, next muscle, which is the semitendinosus, and uh, like the biceps uh, femoris, it has its origin on the posterior medial ischial tuberosity uh, via that uh, that conjoint tendon we just spoke about. And the semitendinosus has a very short uh, proximal tendon up here, uh, so much so that uh, sometimes on some patients you actually won't see much of a tendon at all. It'll almost be a muscular insertion onto that uh, ischial tuberosity. So a very short uh, tendon up here for the semitendinosus. And the semitendinosus travels almost um, straight down uh, the leg here, and it will overlie the semimembranosus. So that's another key landmark you want to know, is that the semitendinosus is on top of the semimembranosus. In fact, when we're talking about on top of the semitendinosus tendon, is on the top of the screen. The semitendinosus muscle in the middle here will be on the top of the ultrasound screen. And when you're down here at the knee area, the distal semitendinosus tendon will always be on the top of the screen. 
So the T's go together. So the semitendinosus with the T will always be on the top of the screen. And the semitendinosus is also innervated by the tibial nerve. So there's another T there. So all those T's go together to help describe that anatomy of the semitendinosus. Now, an important part of the semitendinosus, which is another excellent landmark to use for your anatomy, is it has this, uh, what's known as an inscription, which is a sort of a, a fascial band uh, that runs diagonally through the muscle in about its mid portion here. We'll show you some examples of that a little bit later on. And that uh, divides that muscle into the proximal and distal compartments. And uh, this inscription is a really good landmark for knowing that you're looking at the semitendinosus. And one of the problems um, sonographers can get when they see this inscription sailing past, we'll have a look at some scans a little bit later on, is they can get confused. I think it's two different muscles. But if you just remember that that semitendinosus has this inscription that runs through the tendon, uh, once again, that's going to be a good landmark for you not to get confused with. And the third muscle we're going to be talking about, obviously in the hamstrings, is that semimembranosus. Now, the semimembranosus origin is also going to be the posterior ischial tuberosity, but it's going to be a little bit more lateral uh, than the conjoint tendon. And as we said earlier, that uh, semimembranosus is going to lie deep to the semitendinosus. In fact, the semimembranosus sort of acts like a hammock and the semitendinosus sort of sits in the hammock of the semimembranosus. Now, the semimembranosus uh, muscle will be medial. So you can remember those M's go together. The semimembranosus muscle is medial. And then that will insert onto the uh, posterior medial uh, condyle of the tibia. And it's also innervated by that, uh, that tibial nerves. Now, the semimembranosus gets its name from the very thin, broad, and long proximal tendon. And if we have a look on this uh, little cine loop or this little movie here, we can see that at the very, very top, this tendon is very, very thin. Uh, and it's so thin that it's very hard to see on the ultrasound. And unless you're actually looking for this really thin membranous portion, uh, portion of the um, tendon, you don't actually realize it's there. We'll show you some examples of that a little bit later on. But that's the semimembranosus tendon very, very thin and long at the top, and it has a rather short tendon um, inferiorly. Now, that's opposed to the semitendinosus, which has a very short proximal tendon and has a very long distal tendon. So once again, they're sort of, sort of opposites. So that's the uh, basic anatomy of the hamstrings. So let's have a look at some imaging now and um, some of these landmark images you really need to know your anatomy of. Now, this first one we see here is uh, at the origin of the hamstrings. So we have here, this is our ischial uh, tuberosity, so we're right up uh, in the buttock area in around here, and we just put some color on it. So in red here, we have that conjoint tendon. Remember that conjoint tendon is the combined tendon between our uh, semitendinosus and our biceps femoris. And once again, being the semitendinosus, it is on the top of the screen. So this is our conjoint tendon here. And a little bit more laterally and deeper or anteriorly, since this patient is going to be lying prone, uh, this is our semimembranosus tendon uh, just in here. So if you uh, remember, this is a landmark image with the conjoint tendon here, semimembranosus here. We can see we have our sciatic nerve is a little bit more uh, lateral over here. And on this patient here, we have this structure here, which is a vein. This is known as a persistent sciatic vein. It's a um, normal variant. It's quite rare. Uh, but my model for a lot of these um, hamstring images uh, has this persistent sciatic vein. So uh, you won't see that on many patients at all. It's just uh, an interesting variant. So moving down a little bit more inferiorly now, and the next landmark image you're going to want to be able to recognize and describe is uh, the semitendinosus. So let's get some color on here. So here is our semitendinosus all here in red. And here is that inscription we've just seen here. We're going to see a signal of this in a moment, and we'll see the inscription going through. But just on this very first image, important to realize that this area here and this area here 
are not two different muscles. They are the same muscle. This whole thing is that semitendinosus. Once again, the semitendinosus is being on the top of the screen. And remember how I said that the semimembranosus uh, acts as a hammock on which the semitendinosus will sit. Well, here is our semimembranosus uh, hammock in here. So this area here is our semimembranosus muscle. And this is that semimembranosus tendon in here. And if we take the color off, we can see how absolutely thin that membranous portion is in here. It's so thin that it just looks like a normal fascia. You can't really see it. Here is a semimembranosus uh, tendon. It's sort of all around here. That forms more of a, a round typical tendon. But once you realize that this tendon here is connected by a membranous part of the tendon along here to form this muscle over here, uh, the anatomy starts to make a little bit more sense. So all of this in green here is that semimembranosus acting as a hammock for the semitendinosus over the top with that inscription uh, we can see just in there. Now the next image is going to be focused on a little bit more laterally. So this area just over here. So we'll go on to that next image. And once again, I put the color on. So again, here is our semitendinosus we just saw. There is our semimembranosus tendon. Here is that membranous portion of the semimembranosus tendon here. And now a little bit more laterally, we have this muscle here in blue, which is our biceps femoris. Remember we said the biceps femoris and the semitendinosus had that conjoint tendon, so had a shared tendon. We see that shared tendon uh, here in green, uh, just in between the two. And remember we said that deep to the biceps femoris long head, which we have here in blue, is our sciatic nerve. So if you get uh, this key landmark image uh, clear in your mind, that we have the long head of the biceps, the sciatic nerve, this semitendinosus with its shared conjoint tendon here, and the semimembranosus underneath. If you've got that in your mind, once you scan up and down and, and follow all these uh, muscles and tendons, uh, the anatomy uh, will be a lot more clear. So they're the basic three positions that you need to know and be able to recognize the anatomy. So we'll have a look at some, uh, some cine loops now and just to see how that all blends into each other. So when I do a hamstring ultrasound, I like to image each of these three muscles individually. And I tend to start with the semitendinosus. So uh, the probe is uh, transverse over the ischial tuberosity here with our semitendinosus over the top here. And on this video, a cine loop, we're going to be scanning from the top of the semitendinosus all the way down to the bottom. And we're going to see that uh, inscription uh, passing through the semitendinosus. So let's uh, watch this video now. There is our semitendinosus tendon, or the chondroid tendon. There's a chondroid tendon going over here. This is semitendinosus. But here's that inscription. Seeing that inscription going all the way across. So this is all semitendinosus. We're going inferiorly now. The semitendinosus is getting smaller and smaller. And here is that distal tendon, quite a long tendon. There it comes, and it's now going to insert onto that uh, medial part of the tibia. There it is there. So let's just take that video back just a little bit. So here is our conjoint tendon. So that's that uh, combined tendon between the semitendinosus and the biceps femoris. As we go a little bit further down, once again, there is our conjoint tendon just here. This is all semitendinosus and we're going to see this inscription coming across here in a moment as we keep going and there's that inscription sailing across there now as i go back and forth you can see that inscription moving and once you realize that this and this are the same muscle they're not two different muscles they're just the one muscle with this sort of scepter in between the two we can see that going across there now and now we can see that this is all semitendinosus and then the distal musculo or the distal tendon is going to start forming from this area just up here. So we'll see all these fibers being sucked up into this area here as this distal tendon starts to progress. There it is. We can see that tendon forming and that very long tendon going all the way down. Now remember I said those musculotendinous junctions will actually overlap each other. So if we roll this video backwards here now, um, we can see here is our semitendinosus uh, tendon just up in here. And 
As we're going more proximally, a little bit further on, we can see this is semitendinosus tendon, uh, the intramuscular part of the tendon just in here. A little bit further back, still got tendon, we've still got tendon, we've still got tendon, this is still the tendon in here. Tendon, 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 and about now this tendon has stopped. But if we keep going, we can see this inscription here going past. There's the inscription. And there is our conjoint tendon over here. So now if we go inferiorly, we want to see where this uh, conjoint tendon will stop. So we can see the tendon there. We've still got tendon over here. We've still got tendon, there's still tendon, there's the inscription coming to join, and the in tendon stops about now, about here. But we've already got this distal tendon forming here. So this just shows how those uh, distal muscular tendon junctions will actually overlap with the proximal muscular tendon junctions. And if remember that muscular tendon junctions tend to be where the, te uh, the tears occur, so we know if we keep our eye on this area, over here for the distal tendon throughout the whole length and this area what's off the screen over, over this side for the proximal tendon if we know where those muscular tendon junctions are we can focus our concentration on those areas and uh, we're going to be able to see those tears hopefully so that's the semitendinosis as i say that's the one i like to look at uh, first because it has that excellent landmark of that inscription uh, through the middle of it the next muscle I'll look at is the semimembranosus. And the semimembranosus, remember the tendon here is a little bit deeper, so a little bit more anterior, and it's a little bit more lateral. So it's going to start there, and as we uh, scan through on the city loop, uh, we'll watch that tendon go from uh, lateral across to medial and join up uh, with its muscle. Let's have a look at this um, city loop now. So there's our uh, tendon. There's a tendon going underneath the semitendinosus, and there's the muscle starting to form medially. And you'll see they'll join up. So there is semimembranosus muscle uh, proper there, coming all the way down the medial part of the posterior thigh. Remember, the semimembranosus muscle is medial, and we can see it has a very short tendon, and wham, inserts just about there. So let's just um, run through that city loop a little bit more slowly so here is our semi membranosus tendon here it's starting off laterally and it's going to move medially uh, as we go inferiorly so as we go down inferiorly now there's our semi membranosus uh, tendon and now we can see here the semi membranosus tendon is deep to our semi tendinosus muscle and all this area here is our membranous portion of our semimembranosus uh, muscle complex. We can't really see the muscle yet. The muscle is going to start forming in over about here. As we go down a little bit further inferiorly, there's our semimembranosus muscle starting to form. And there it is just in there. And as that muscle starts to form, it's going to go over to our tendon over here. And now we can see where... At the end of the proximal tendon, uh, just over here, and all this is our semi uh, membranosus muscle. Remember, it's medial. As you go further uh, inferiorly, we can see all these fibers are starting to uh, coalesce in this area up here, which is where our uh, tendon is going to start arising from. There they are, coming up in towards the tendon over here. There's our tendon proper with a very short tendon as it inserts uh, just in and around there. So that's our semi-membranosis. And once again, we just have to realize that this muscle over here is actually joined to this tendon over here by this thin membranous uh, part of the tendon. As we go further proximally, we can see this muscle here is actually joined by this thin membranous part of the tendon over to the tendon proper over here. So that's our semimembranosus. Remember the muscle is medial and the semimembranosus acts as a bit of a hammock with the semitendinosus uh, on top. And then the final muscle of the hamstrings I look at is the biceps femoris. Now if you remember our biceps femoris 
uh, has that conjoined tendon here with the uh, semitendinosus. So while the semitendinosus sort of comes straight down, the biceps femoris is going to be coming out a little bit more uh, laterally. So let's just watch this video and uh, we'll see how this uh, biceps femoris comes into play. But there's our conjoint tendon on the top. And now we're moving a little bit more laterally. So there's a conjoint tendon here in the middle. And now we can see our biceps femoris uh, coming out over here with our sciatic nerve deep to it. Here is our short head coming up over here. And now our longer head is getting smaller. Our shorter head is becoming dominant. And then this sole forms into our tendon just up into here, which will then come down and insert onto our fibular head. So once again, we can just uh, run that video again a little bit more slowly. So there is our conjoint tendon. So as we come down, we see that conjoint tendon uh, about now becomes quite vertical. This is our semitendinosus here, and this is our long head of our biceps femoris here. And underneath our biceps femoris, there is our sciatic nerve uh, that we saw earlier. So as we keep scrolling down, now we can see this uh, long head of our biceps is getting bigger. We store the last uh, part of the chondroid tendon here, this proximal muscular tendinous junction, uh, still present down here. As we go a little bit further down, and we can just see down here, here is, here is our femur, and here is our little uh, linear spira, a little bump coming off the femur. And we can just see here now, this is our short head starting to arise from that posterior aspect of uh, the femur. We'll just scroll that back and forth. So we can see there's our short head starting to form in here. And as we go a little bit further down, we can see that short head is getting bigger. And as we go down to the distal part of the hamstrings, the short head actually becomes the dominant part of the biceps femoris. So there's our short head here. Here is our long head here. The long head here will uh, become a tendon relatively quickly. Up into this area here, now that's tendon. And this is all short head muscle. And as we go a little bit more uh, inferiorly, all these uh, muscle fibers will start to coalesce and to form the tendon proper in around over here as we keep going down. And we see they're all coming up and going in. And there is our tendon just forming in around there. So once again, inferiorly, we have our semi, our short head of our biceps femoris is dominant with our long head uh, a little bit smaller. And then as we get up past the origin here of our short head, here is our long head of our biceps femoris. Here is our um, sciatic nerve. And over here is going to be our uh, semitendinosus uh, we saw here uh, earlier. And there is our conjoint tendon uh, just coming in here. So by going systematically through each of these three uh, muscles, and as I say, I like to do semitendinosus first, then go medially, do the semimembranosus, and then go out laterally and do the biceps femoris. By looking at those musculotendinous junctions, and by going through all of these uh, muscles systematically, the navigation through the hamstrings uh, is made just that little bit easier. So we've had a look at the anatomy, and now we can have a look at the uh, pathology. Now, the pathology you get with the hamstrings is virtually the same as you get with in, in any other uh, musculoskeletal ultrasound. You're going to get uh, tendinosis, endosopathy, uh, tears. They can either be partial tears or complete tears. And um, you can get tears that either involve just the tendon or those musculotendinous junctions. As I said, they're the most common ones to get. You can get intramuscular tears or myofascial separations. We're going to talk about those a little bit later on. Um, the hamstrings uh, can become evolved off that ischial tuberosity, uh, bursitis, and you can also get pathology of the sciatic nerves. So tendinosis or encephalopathy. Uh, virtually the same as, as I said, you get with any other MSK. You're going to get uh, thickening of the tendon. Uh, the tendon is going to become heterogeneous. You can get some calcifications. You may get some bony irregularities or some of that uh, encithop encithopathy. Um, you may or may not get vascularity. Uh, unlike, say, the common extensor tendon of the elbow, um, you get, often get a lot of vascularity there with a bit of tendinopathy. You often won't get that with the... Um, with the hamstrings, often you've got to push 
are quite firm and it's at, you know, it's uh, quite deep a long way down. So you don't always get the vascularity. But we can just see we've got a bit of a thickened conjoint tendon here. We've got some calcifications uh, in the tendon here. And on this one here, we just have very hypoechoic looking um, semi-membranosis tendon. A few calcifications in there and a rather irregular looking um, ischial tuberosity or just some signs of some uh, tendinosis. So here we have um, the conjoint tendon on the top. And remembering this area, this area over here is going to be our semi-membranosis tendon. And this is an important thing to realize that how close our sciatic nerve is. There's a sciatic nerve right in there. So when we get tendinosis of our semi-membranosis portion of the hamstrings here, that can really affect the uh, sciatic nerve here because they're so close. You can see that uh, semi-membranosis tendon has enlarged uh, so much it's now starting to uh, rub against that um, sciatic nerve. So you're going to be getting uh, sciatic pain from this sort of patient. So if the patient has sciatic pain, it's unexplained and their spine looks fine, then it could well be coming from uh, this area here in the uh, hamstring origin. Now, if in doubt, you can always uh, compare with the other side. So um, here we have, you know, hypoechoic, not that thick, but it is certainly hypoechoic, a little bit irregular here. Uh, but if we look on the other side here, we can see chondroin tendon very, very thin at the top. This is all semi-membranosis here. And we can see that this area here is nowhere near as uh, thickened and um, hypoechoic as this area over here. So this is certainly some uh, tendinosis of the um, hamstrings origin, both the conjoint tendon over the top and of that semi-membranosis tendon here a little bit more laterally. Like with any uh, tendinosis, we can inject them as well. We can either inject them with um, a steroid. We can do autologous blood injections, uh, which is what this little cine loop here is. I uh, do dry needling. Um, you can also do uh, PRP or platelet-rich plasma injections. Uh, into these uh, hamstring origins just to give a patient a bit of relief. So we can see we're doing uh, the autologous blood injection there with some dry needling as well, just sliding that needle in and out uh, and trying to get some healing happening uh, in this uh, inflamed semi-membranosis tendon. Sometimes you might see a chronic injury of the semi-tendinosis because the semi-tendinosis can be used for an ACL uh, repair. Sometimes use the semitendinosis, other times they will combine it with a semitendinosis and a gracilis uh, repair. But on this little video here, we can see there is our semitendinosis here. There's our inscription coming off. And at this area here, it's starting to just look a little bit uh, irregular. And once again, there's our semitendinosis tendon on the top. It's starting to look uh, quite thin and not as big as the other side. Uh, this example is actually the other leg of the model I've used for all my other uh, other images. And if we go back then a little bit more, go backwards. So there's our semitendinosis there. There's our inscription coming through just in here. And then once we get to about here, it start, we're starting to lose a little bit of definition of those muscle fibers in around there. A bit of scar tissue. It looks a little bit hazy as we go further down. And still just looks a loss of definition in here with the scar tissue. A little bit further down, we get into the semitendinosis proper. And we can see here that tendon is actually quite small, but it is still intact. There's certainly tendon fibers in here. And uh, when I was scanning uh, this model's other leg, I said, have you ever injured your hamstring? He goes, oh, no, not that I know of. And I said, well, have you ever done your ACL? And he goes, oh, yeah, I've done my ACL. So what they did... Uh, is they harvested his semi-tendinosis tendon and used that to repair the ACL. And uh, in about 75% of patients that have their semi-tendinosis harvested, uh, it will grow back. Now, it never looks quite as good as it does originally, uh, but we can see here that tendon has, uh, has grown back, and, uh, but the muscle there still looks that uh, a little bit irregular. So just be wary of that when you're doing these hamstring ultrasounds and ask the patient if they've had, a, uh, had an ACL repair. Now, when it comes to tears and ruptures, uh, these are very common in the hamstring. And the most common sort of tear you're going to get is this proximal musculotendinous junction tear, 
of the biceps femoris. And that's more common in runners and footballers. And if you think about it, that makes sense as well. As you can see with this uh, chap here, when you see either a footballer or a runner um, doing a hammy, the first thing they will do is they'll reach down with their hand, reach behind their back, lateral part of their thigh, which is right over the biceps femoris uh, tendon. So uh, the biceps femoris muscular tendon junction is more common in runners and footballers. Uh, dancers and people who do a lot of uh, stretching, as we can see this um, person doing a lot of stretching here, they're more likely to injure their proximal muscular tendon junction of the semi-membranosus. Water skiers, on the other hand, will tend to have an avulsion of their hamstrings from the ischial tuberosity. And if you think about it, the ankles are held in 90 degrees flexion by the boot. The knees are in full extension. And if this water ski was to fall forward, then with the knees in extension and the hips flexing, an enormous amount of uh, stress is placed on that hamstring. And it's probably, and it could very well pull off that issue of tuberosity. So you're going to get a proximal avulsion. Now, if you have a isolated muscular tendons injury, more common to get that in the long head of the biceps, then the semi-membranosis and then the semi-tendinosis. Combined muscular tendons uh, junction injuries will be in that um, biceps femoris and the semi-tendinosis. We'll have a look at that a little bit later on. And distal muscular tendons junctions are more likely to be in the long head of the biceps. And we'll show some examples of that later on. Now, this is by no means a hard and fast uh, rule for where these tears are going to recur, uh, but this uh, sort of the uh, the general uh, way that these uh, these tears occur. Now, when we're talking about tears in the hair strings, there's lots of different grading uh, mechanisms, uh, but the most common one uh, that is around is called the BAMIC classification. And BAMIC stands for the British Athletics Muscle Injury Classification. And it essentially has four, if not five grades, if you can count grade zero, of muscle tears. And uh, in grades one, two, three, and four, they have a subgrading depending on what part of the muscle or muscular tendinous junction has been involved. So um, the first subpart is the subpart A. So you have a tear of the uh, myofascial area. So the uh, myofascial area is this area on the outside of the muscle and it affects just these sort of outer fibers of the muscle, that's myofascial. Uh, that muscular tendinous junction, which we've spoken so much about, obviously is that junction between uh, the tendon here and the muscle. So these are the most common we get is the subpart Bs. And you can actually get a subpart C where you get a tear of the uh, tendon itself without any apparent tearing of the muscle or the muscular tendinous junction. Now, the grading of the tears uh, is dependent on the degree of cross-sectional area that's involved. So small muscle tears or grade ones uh, will involve less than 10% of the cross-sectional area of the muscle. And notice that the grade ones don't have a uh, subgrading of intended involvement. If there's any tendon involvement in a muscle tear, it's going to be graded as minimum of a grade two. A grade two is a moderate muscle tear it's going to have um, up to 50% cross-sectional area involved in the muscle or a length of between, say, 5 and 15 centimetres involved. And once again, the grade twos are subdivided into the A, Bs and Cs, depending if it's myofascial, musculotendinous or just the tendon. Now, the grade threes or an extensive muscle tear will involve greater than 50% of the muscle or greater than 15 centimetres. And then finally, you have a grade four, which is a complete muscle tear. Now, obviously, you won't subdivide that into a myofascial, fascial, or musculotendinous junction because it's the entire muscle has torn. But you can divide it into just a 4C. And with a 4C, you can have just a complete tear of the tendon, but all these muscles here, uh, all the muscle fibers itself, can remain intact. So when you have a look on the ultrasound, you see the muscle itself is uh, quite intact. You think it was not a particularly bad tear, but because the tendon itself is completely ruptured, the whole uh, infrastructure of that uh, muscle has, has gone. There is no strength muscle at all. There's no uh, tendon there. So these uh, tendon 
tears of the intramuscular part of the tendon without the muscles being involved are still graded at the maximum here of a 4C. Now this classification system is based on MRI imaging, um, but I think we can also translate that into our ultrasound imaging, uh, imaging as well. So let's have a look at uh, just a couple of examples. So here we have an image, a cross-sectional image of the long head of the biceps. And we can see this area up in the top left-hand corner of the screen here. We've got uh, some loss of definition of these, uh, these muscle fibers. Uh, the bit of hyper-echoic uh, muscle tissue here. So we can measure the area here. Now I haven't got the actual area measurements on this, uh, on this image, but that's going to be certainly uh, more than 10%, but less than 50%. It's going to be involving probably the myofascium, which is just this area up in here. So this is the uh, epimysium run, running around the whole outside of the tendon. So this we regarded probably as a 2A uh, muscle tear. This one here of the semimembranosis tendon we have in here. Now, because there is a tear of the tendon automatically, that's going to make that into at least a grade 2. Uh, it's only a, quite a small grade 2, so we're going to call this a grade 2 C because it involves uh, the tendon itself and this is of the uh, semimembranosis with the ischial tuberosities coming in here. This area down here we see some uh, tearing of the fibres in and around here. This is our uh, musculotendinous junction between the uh, semitendinosis and our biceps femoris. Probably get a bit of uh, sciatic nerve just in here. So this is our conjoint tendon here in the centre. So this is going to be a musculotendinous junction tear. It's only quite small. We haven't actually measured the area of it here, but it's only quite small. So this would be considered a 1B. So it's a small grade tear, B, because it involves the musculotendinous junction with that uh, conduit tendon uh, just here. And as I say, these uh, subclassifications of B, these musculotendinous junction tears, are probably the most common. Now, the reason why the tears around this conjoint tendon are the most common just comes to shear biomechanics. So we have our conjoint tendon here in the center. And if you remember, our biceps femoris will insert uh, laterally onto the fibular head and our semitendinosis will insert onto the medial part of the knee. So the forces along the semitendinosis are away from the conjoint tendon here in the center. The forces on the biceps femoris are away from the conjoint tendon in the center here. So all the forces are acting in opposing directions all around this uh, conjoint tendon, which uh, predisposes this area along here, this musculotendinous junction around the conjoint tendon, to frequent tearing. Now, I've said quite a lot about these musculotendinous junctions uh, traveling throughout the whole uh, muscle. Here's just a schematic diagram of what we're looking at. This one here is a biceps femoris. We can see our muscle, uh, this is the uh, yeah, long head of the biceps femoris. Uh, this is our muscle belly here. We can see this is our proximal tendon. And all this here is our uh, proximal musculotendinous junction just into here. Here is our distal tendon. Uh, this area here is our distal musculotendinous junction. And we can see we have overlap right around here of those musculotendinous junctions. So when we're doing our scanning, we really do need to focus our eyes on these musculotendinous junctions because these are the most likely places uh, we're going to be seeing tearing. And it was to see how they overlap here. And on B here, we have our semimembranosis. Uh, we can see we've got overlap of our musculotendinous junctions in our semimembranosis here. So they're the important areas to look at. So here we can see a tear of the long head of the uh, biceps chest in here. I didn't take these images. These were taken by a, uh, a colleague of mine. Uh, so this will be a, uh, an intramuscular tear uh, we can see in here. Now, this is probably coming from um, a myofascial area because this is our long head here. This is our short head here. There's going to be myofascial uh, fiber, uh, tissue in between our two heads of our uh, biceps here. So this is a tear down here. Some people call that intramuscular. It could well be just a myofascial because it probably extends this fascia, fascia down in here. Now, this myofascial uh, separation is just when the muscle fibers itself separate uh, from the uh, epimysium or that fascial layer that wraps around the entire muscle. Uh, when the 
muscle pulls away from that, you're going to get a, a myofascial separation. So we can see the muscle has pulled off uh, from the epimysium just in here. And here on this uh, semitendinosus in here, we can see a little bit of blood products just up in here. If we have a look at the next uh, slide, we see a bit of a cine loop coming in through here. So here's our semitendinosus, and here is our tear in our blood we can see just up in there. And we can just see our semimembranosus muscle uh, coming in around here with a little bit of blood uh, just around in there. So this is, it's going to be a myofascial separation, or it could be a musculotendinous tear of that semimembranosus. It's sometimes very hard to tell the difference between a myofascial tear or just the very distal ends of that musculo, uh, musculotendinous junction. Now, you may remember I said earlier that the uh, distal musculotendinous junction of the biceps uh, femoris is a common area of, or the common site of a tear, and they will often occur in this area here called the, uh, called the T-junction, which we can just see in and around here, uh, these pictures. Now, the anterolateral uh, epimysial surface of the long head of the biceps, we can just see uh, in here, uh, this condenses to form the proximal portion of the distal musculotendinous junction. Now, as this long head uh, gets smaller distally, we can see it getting smaller here, and it's gone here. The opposing posteromedial surface of the epimysium of the short head will also condense um, to form the musculotendinous junction. And we can see here, we have a T-shape in here. So this T-shape here, there's a top part of it just there, and the distal part of it just there. This is a common site of tearing. Now, the different sites of origins of our um, biceps femoris, i.e. the back of the femur and of the ischial tuberosity, give uh, rise to different force vectors, just like we saw on our uh, conjoint 10 earlier. Uh, so this area in here is a common site for tearing. And also remember that our long head is innervated by the uh, tibial nerve and our short head is innervated by a perineal nerve. So they may have ever so slightly uh, different uh, uh, innovation times, which can lead to tearing in this area here. And we can see this little, uh, this little T shape just in here called the T junction. And we can see that on the ultrasounds uh, quite clearly. And we see here is the T junction shown really nicely here. Now on this model, I've gone up and used the 18 megahertz probe. You can use the 18 megahertz probe on a lot of these um, uh, hamstrings if it's a if it's a smaller patient. Uh, we see these matrix probes have uh, really good uh, definition uh, right from the superficial area right down to the um, to the deep area. Uh, no loss of definition there at all, and you get a really good look uh, at these musculo musculotendinous junctions just in here. So this is our distal musculotendinous uh, T junction uh, just in here, and on the next little C loop. You can just see it um, coming through here. So here is our uh, short head. This is our long head. We can see a definite T-shape in here. Very common sight uh, for that discal musculotendinous junction uh, tears to occur in this T uh, junction here. So that's another area you can certainly uh, keep an eye out for looking for any of those tears. So you can also get, as we said, an intramuscular tendon rupture. And now this example here isn't actually in the hamstring, it's in the uh, gracilis, but it shows uh, quite nicely how the muscle itself can remain intact, but the internal tendon can be uh, completely disrupted. So here we have our gracilis up in here. And as you pay the cine loop through, we can see the tendon is going to start to form in this area over here. And then we'll see where the tendon is completely ruptured. So let's have a look at this video. We can see here, we can see there's a big black hole occurring about now. There are, and then it comes back into play there. And there is our uh, gracilis tendon distally. So we can just rewind that back a bit. So there is our gracilis just in here. And as we go inferiorly, we can see there's some disruption to the fibers up in here. There's the tendon starting to form in here. So the intramuscular uh, part of the tendon. And we can see as we keep going down, that tendon is about to disappear. There is nice and bright. And there it is, just completely disappeared. And there's absolutely no tendon there holding uh, the muscle together. The muscle itself, you can see, looks completely intact, but it has no structural integrity uh, because that internal tendon 
uh, has completely ruptured. As we go more inferiorly, we can see that uh, that tendon coming back just in here, and a little bit more inferiorly, there's our tendon proper. And we can have a look in long. So here is our gracilis in here. There is our uh, internal uh, intramuscular uh, tendon. Here is the rupture here, and there's a big gap in here. So this uh, no structural integrity at all, integrity at all in this muscle because this intramuscular tendon has been ruptured. Uh, this will be considered in the Bamic scale of the highest order. This would be a 4C rupture, uh, and this is quite a serious injury. As I said, uh, water skiers and the like can have bony avulsions. We can see the hamstring here has been uh, pulled off. This is a long picture of the hamstring here. There is our ischial tuberosity here. We can see the hamstring is pulled off and has left with a little avulsion fracture here. And on the resulting X-ray, uh, we can see this area here. Bony avulsions are actually quite unusual in an adult. They're more common in uh, adolescence. And because you get an avulsion through that ischial apophysis just in here, rather than a fracture of the uh, ischium itself, as you see in an adult. And here are some avulsions without, uh, without fractures. So here we have our conjoined tendon here with a bit of bull nosing, clearly some empty space in here, uh, and a complete uh, gap. So this is a complete uh, avulsion. Uh, there's the same patient here. We can see, you know, separated by about two, uh, two centimeters here. And that two centimeters is actually a bit of an important uh, number to remember because when it comes to um, surgical repair, you have the rule of twos. So if there's more than two centimeters retraction or more than two tendons are involved, uh, more than likely going, uh, going for surgery. So trying to identify uh, these, a, uh, these avulsions is very important. As we can see in the image down on the bottom left here, can be very hard uh, in the acute phase, given the uh, amount of hematoma. Very hard to tell if there's any uh, tendon or muscle involvement in here, or if all this is just uh, hematoma, it's all very dark. You know, might be some muscle fibers here. It's very hard to tell. Sometimes it can be useful to uh, compare with the other side. So if we have a look at these images here. These images look virtually identical. So we have the semi-tendinosis here and the semi-membranosis here. And virtually the same image we have over here. There's our semimembranosis here. There's our semitendinosis here. But if you have a look at the annotations uh, on the left-hand side, it's only five centimeters below the buttock crease. But on the right-hand side, it's about eight centimeters below the buttock crease. So this whole hamstring has moved inferiorly by about uh, three centimeters. So this would indicate that something like this is actually uh, not a partial tear, this is a complete tear because the whole structure has moved inferiorly. So comparing with the other side uh, can be quite helpful. So this slide here really emphasizes the importance of trying to identify these tears uh, when we can. Now in a study of 41 patients with an average um, follow-up time of 37 months, 71% reported good or excellent results 37 months after surgery if their surgery was, was done within about two, two and a half months uh, of the injury. Now, 29% of these people reported poor results. And of those 29%, uh, percent, uh, they had their surgery delayed by um, almost 12 months. So you can see the importance of early surgical repair is going to lead to uh, much better results for the patients. So if we can identify these tears on ultrasound and they can get their surgery done uh, sooner, that's going to lead for, uh, for better patient outcomes. So let's have a quick look at the uh, insertions uh, now. Now the first one I want to talk about is our biceps uh, femoris insertion. As we know, it inserts onto our uh, head of our fibula. And this area in here uh, can often look very heterogeneous. It can often look uh, hypoagoic. And you need to be very careful about calling any uh, tendinopathy of the biceps femoris insertion uh, in this region. And that's because the biceps femoris and the lateral collateral ligament actually sort of pass uh, through each other. So we can see on this cine loop here I'm about to play that the biceps uh, femoris tendon will split and goes completely around the lateral collateral ligament 
before it inserts into the fibula. So let's have a look at that now. So there is our biceps femoris. And as we scroll through, we can see just in here, there is our uh, lateral collateral ligament. And as we just uh, scan back and forth, we can see how that biceps femoris here and our, there, there's our lateral collateral ligament, there's our biceps femoris. They go in two different directions and they actually go through each other. So this area where they cross over, if I just go back to this area just here, you can often get a hypoechoic area in around here. This is just where the lateral collateral ligament is passing through the biceps femoris. If you don't get any color in this area around here, I would not be calling this tendinosis at all. However, if their patient had pain here and there was a lot of vascularity in the area, then I'll be more inclined to uh, call that some tendinopathy. Uh, but if there's no color, I would not be calling that tendinopathy because of the way that uh, tendon and the lateral collateral ligament interact. Now on the medial side, uh, we have our pes anserinus. Now the pes anserinus is a common tendon from our uh, sartorius here, our gracilis in here, and our semitendinosus. That's our hamstring tendon inserting onto the uh, anteromedial tibia here. And deep to this pes anserinus, we have this anserine bursa, which sits in between the pes and the medial collateral ligament which all just sits very, very close to our other medial hamstring tendon, our semimembranosus we see in here. So see, this is quite a complex area here with a number of different, uh, different uh, bursa. And we can see those on the ultrasound. We'll put some color on it. So here we have our um, sartorius. This is our gracilis. And this is our semitendinosus here all lying over the top of our lateral collateral ligament in here. So our pes anserine bursa is this area all the way uh, in through here. So that's a common site we can look at uh, when it comes to um, some fluid in the anserine bursa and if people have pain of pathology in and around our insertions. But as I say, uh, most of the pathology uh, on the tendons is going to occur in the proximal uh, hamstring origins at the ischial tuberosity. So just in the last part of this lecture, I would like to uh, have a bit of a chat about the sciatic nerve and the piriformis. So as we've already seen, the sciatic nerve here passes uh, lateral to our uh, hamstring origin. We can see the hamstring origin coming off the ischial tuberosity here. And the sciatic nerve will pass over a group of muscles. First one here is our quadratus femoris here. And then we have our inferior gemellus. We have our obturator internus. And this one on the top here is our superior uh, gemellus. Uh, Netta doesn't really do this area here that much justice. The obturator internus in this level here is almost all tendon. There's not much muscle here, so this is a little bit misleading. So we'll see muscle, we'll see tendon, we'll see muscle, um, over which the sciatic nerve is lying. And then the sciatic nerve will dive in between our superior gemellus here and our piriformis uh, in here. And this is, um, uh, this is a site of uh, possible entrapment of our sciatic nerve. So here we have a long picture up of the sciatic nerve. I'll put some color on it. So here we are, uh, have our sciatic nerve here in yellow. Here is our quadratus femoris we saw just before. This muscle down here is our inferior gemellus. And here is our obturator internus. We can see it's quite hyperechoic because it's almost all tendon here. This is our uh, superior gemellus with our uh, sciatic nerve running over the top here and then diving underneath our uh, piriformis uh, just in here. Now we can do some dynamic scanning of the sciatic nerve just to see if there's any entrapment or adhesions to any of the underlying uh, muscles. Now on this image here on the left, uh, we are just a little bit more lateral to our hamstring origin. We can just see the issue, pardon me, the issue of tuberosity here conjoint tendon at the top, semimembranosus here. Here is our sciatic nerve. And we've got the patient uh, lying prone on the bed with their knee flexed. And on the city loop, all I'm doing is I'm moving the lower leg from side to side, sort of a bit like a pendulum from a grandfather clock, moving it side to side, see if we can see uh, how well this sciatic nerve is sliding. 
So we can see here now moving the leg back and forth side to side and we can see our um, quadratus femoris uh, underneath here sliding very nicely underneath our sciatic nerve and we can see our gluteus maximus uh, sliding over the top. So we can see the um, sciatic nerve is moving freely. So if you have any tears or pathology on, uh, in this area here, you can just check whether you've got any entrapment of the sciatic nerve. And you can also do this in long. So we can see we've got long here. Here is our sciatic nerve here in long. And instead of moving the lower leg uh, from side to side in a tick-tock sort of uh, maneuver, all I'm doing is I'm extending the knee and flexing the knee back up. And we can once again uh, see how this sciatic nerve quite nicely uh, slides around these muscles here. So as I said, if we have a tear of our hamstrings, we can get some hematoma or some fibrosis can entrap the sciatic nerve. So we're just doing these very simple dynamic nerves. We can just ensure that our sciatic nerve is free of any, uh, any entrapment. Now you may well have heard of piriformis syndrome. Uh, this is when the sciatic nerve is compressed or is impinged as it passes the piriformis muscle. The symptoms can be similar to that of sciatica, which are due to bulging or a herniated disc within the spine. Now, true piriformis syndrome is actually quite rare and is probably more appropriately referred to as subgluteal or deep gluteal syndrome, as there are a number of different sites of compression uh, of that uh, static nerve uh, other than just uh, via the piriformis just in here. So our role with ultrasound is mainly to determine if there is any anatomical variations uh, to the part of, path of the static nerve that could be causing the compression, or to see if there are any uh, entrapments or impingements to the nerve uh, by performing those dynamic scans that we just showed you in the previous slide. So here are some examples here of the different anatomical variations you can get of the static nerve as it passes in and around the uh, piriformis. Type 1 here is the normal one where the static nerve passes deep to the piriformis. We can see that the uh, static nerve could be split and pass either through or deep or over the top or underneath or directly through or any sorts of these, uh, these type of variations. And as I said, that is uh, one of the things that we can be looking for uh, with our ultrasound. And here's just an example here of a static nerve passing under and through the piriformis. Let's put a bit of colour on there so we can see the static nerve coming through here, uh, splitting one part going through the piriformis here, other part going deep to the piriformis here with our um, superior gemellus uh, just in around here. Okay, so that's all I'm going to talk about with the ultrasound of the hamstrings tonight. So hopefully when you go back to work and that hamstring referral comes through, uh, you won't go and try and have an early tea break to avoid it. Uh, you'll be able to confidently navigate your way uh, through the hamstrings and, confident, and confidently find your way around uh, without too much trouble and without getting lost. So thanks very much. And I think we've got some questions and answers. Uh, thanks very much, Brett. Okay, thanks very much, Andrew. Indeed, we do have a questions and answers session. How are you going there, Andrew? Very well, Brett. How are you? Yeah, good, thanks. Thanks very much for the presentation. That was very um, in-depth and informative. And, and, and I highly recommend to people too, to when you get the replay, um, go, go to the sections that um, are of interest to you because it is a great examination to do. Yeah. If you, as I say, okay. if, you, if you do it systematically, it actually it isn't as hard as everyone thinks it is. Yeah, yeah. Get a methodology going, and 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 away you go. One of the questions that I wanted to ask you was um, in relation to your transducer selection, because clearly we'll have different types of patients coming through. You might have a very um, uh, slight or live um, athletic individual coming through, and then you might have a, a rugby player. So that's going to necessitate a different transducer selection and also to when when do you reach for um curved transducers yeah thanks that's a really good question i probably should have addressed that a little bit more in my talk but sort of i ran out of time and eventually forgot um you probably saw on all of my model pictures i was lucky enough that i've got one of my radiographers here is a triathlete so he's got really fabulous muscles and just the right amount of fat um, that all of his muscles and tendons look really good. So I was very lucky. 
Um, I could easily have used uh, my 18 uh, megahertz probe. So um, I've got the 18 LX, so that matrix probe. Mm -hmm. uh, you saw I used that on one of my other models when I looked at the T junction. Uh, so one really, you know, fit thin guys as triathletes. Yes, you can use the 18 quite happily. Uh, you get really good resolution all the way from the near field to the far field. Um, but most of the patients that I get here are not, uh, shall we say, fit athletic people. Um, so the AFL, yeah. So the AFL players. They're all going to get MRIs because they can, and not forgetting that I work in the centre of Melbourne, so we've got you know about 20 MRIs within about 150 metres of me here. Um, yep. So we don't do that many sports people with their hamstrings because they're going to get an MRI because with the MRI they can tell them much better. You know they want to know. Can I return to play in you know five days, seven days, ten days, fourteen days? I mean, they yeah. really have to have a precise diagnosis, and I don't think we're that good at ultrasound at giving that sort of precise diagnosis. I would be a perfect patient for a hamstring on the ultrasound because I'm not an athletic person at all, and I want to know have I got a tear there? You know, how bad is it? And you know, am I just yeah. going to stay off it for a month or so? Because I don't really care if I come back in a month or six weeks. So my go-to probe when I do a hamstring is actually my 14. What's it? The 14 L5. That's correct. And the yeah. reason I like that is because it has that larger form factor. It's a, it's a wider probe. Uh, you can put your uh, wide view on, and uh, on our Canon machines, when you put the wide view on, you really have no loss of image quality in those in those sort of artificially made yeah. areas uh, on the edges. The image quality is great all the way through. And just having that wider field of view, I think helps um, navigate your way around. Because if you've got too close a view on what you're looking at, it's a bit hard to think, well, is this, I mean, is this going to be the uh, biceps or is this the uh, semi-tendinosis? And why haven't I seen that inscription? And, Oh, the tendon nurses is over there. So I like to have a slightly wider view. Uh, so that would be my go-to probe. But then if I do see some pathology, um, instantly I'll go to the 18 megahertz probe. I mean, you know, it, it really isn't that hard to change probes. There is one button you've got to press and it all changes for you. So it's it's pretty easy. So there's no excuse uh, not to go up with a high frequency probe. And then you can have a look um, at that T-junction you can have a look at those myofascial layers um, and just to see if you can see a little hematoma and just get a, a better definition. But as you're saying, on those on those bigger patients that come in, we are struggling to see the hamstrings well. I actually like the, what is the 10C3? Um, yep. Now there's also and the, you're going to correct me here, Brett, is it the 10, uh, what's the magic version? 10XC something? 10, 10C, the, the modern one's the 10CX1. Yeah. Yeah. Now I actually yep. love that pro for a bigger uh, hamstring patient. I don't have the Matrix Pro version of that, unfortunately. I've only got a a linear. Mm -hmm. Maybe you know when I get a new system next year, I might be able to get one. Um, but that actually has really good uh, definition. It has that wide view that I like, um, and it still has really really good quality. So if I'm having any trouble at all, I'm going to go to that um, 10 uh, C3 probe. If you don't have one of those, then by all means use your, you know, your eight um, Adribin probe. Not forgetting that on these really bigger patients where you need the curved probe, you're not really going to be looking for these subtle, small little tears, those little myofascial separations, you know, is that little area there a little bit more echogenic? On these bigger patients where you need the curved probe, what you're going to be saying is, is there a whacking great big tear or have they completely evolved that hamstring off the issue of tuberosity? You know, do we need to get an MRI on this patient? Do we need to send this patient off to see a surgeon? On these bigger patients with those curved probes, you're not really looking for the, for the small detail. So that would be my three probes I use is that um, 14 megahertz, then the 18 to have a good detail, and on those really bigger patients, uh, that 10C3, which is a great curve probe. 
Terrific. We've got a few questions from the audience. Um, the first one here is from Ravinda. Um, how do you differentiate between separation of muscles from compared to hematoma in the fascia? Okay, that's a good question. Um, the fascia that is around uh, the hamstrings, uh, they're actually very, very thin. Now, I'm happy to be corrected here, but I've actually not heard of, or well, I don't think I've seen a hematoma within a fascia, especially in the hamstrings. Uh, you can certainly get them in, say, the uh, tensor fascia lata or even the rectus sheath, because you've got a lot of veins going um, in through the fascia. But in, say, the hamstrings, the reason for the fascia is basically to, basically to contain any muscle tears or any uh, hematoma that comes from the muscle. Um, so I think in the hamstrings, if you did get a hematoma in a fascia, and as I said, I've never heard of one, it would be very hard to differentiate that between a subfascial or a myofascial, which is what the same thing is, uh, separation. Um, and really, it would be treated the same anyway, because you'll have a small little separation, you would grade it. Um, you know, if it's a small enough tear, it's not going to need surgery, you're going to be treated the same anyway. So in the hamstrings, probably don't need to. And as I say, I've never actually heard of one. Um, but they're probably going to be myofascial separations anyway, just where the muscle pulls away from that from the fascia, because the fascia there is only very, very thin. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Ruvinda, for that question. Um, just a general question from Keris uh, about the replay. Um, everybody who's registered for the event will get a replay in the, in the coming day or so. Um, got a question from Tim. Do you have any tips for differentiating enthesopathy from calcific tendinosis? Yeah, um, if you, yes, good question. If the actual bone itself looks like someone's attacked it with a um, bit of sandpaper, so the actual bone is very irregular, I'm going to be calling that, in, uh, in, I can't say it when I'm, I'm, I'm uh, stressed to you like this, uh, in the enthesopathy, um, calcific tendinosis, you are going to be wanting to be seeing um, decent sized pieces of calcium, usually archiform in shape, so rounded, uh, actually within the tendon. You don't want to be seeing these little tiny little linear lines that go along the along the lines of the tendon, um, especially if they're just sort of coming out from, from the bone. So those very, very thin, thin white lines that are within the tendon attaching the bone, that's not tendinopathy, that's not enthesopathy, that's virtually you know, normal wear and tear of a tendon. So with enthesopathy, you're gonna be seeing a very irregular rough looking um, uh, bone, and we're in uh, calcific tendinosis, you're gonna be getting sort of decent sized rounded lumps and bumps of calcium within the tendon rather than those thin linear lines, which really we can, we can ignore because they're virtually normal. Okay, thanks for that. Um, our next question is from Sabrina. Can I ask what the scanning landmarks are again for finding the sciatic nerve um, stroke piriformis region? Uh, yes, so basically when you're scanning, you find the um, uh, origin of your hamstring. So you find your ischial tuberosity, you move slightly laterally and your sciatic nerve will be uh, lateral uh, to your semi-membranosis uh, tendon. And then from then, and I probably, I was thinking when I was watching this uh, presentation myself just before, I should probably really had a diagram of how to find all that. But just after the sciatic nerve um, comes around the ischial tuberosity and starts to head off towards the spine, it does about a 45 degree bend towards midline. So if you're going, where's my camera? If you're going straight up the back of the thigh like that, you've got the ischial tuberosity here. And as soon as it goes past, it hangs off at about 45 degrees and, go up, and goes up that way. And by the time you're looking at where the um, piriformis is, you are nowhere near the buttock crease. So if you've got the probe in and around the buttock crease trying to look for the piriformis, uh, you are way too low. You have to be, I think, in the proximal half of the buttock. It is a long, long way more proximal than you think it is. And the 
nerve, as I say, angles at about 45 degrees uh, that way. Now, the first big muscle you're going to see that's just at the level of the ischial tuberosity is a big square muscle called quadratus, uh, quadratus femoris. It's a square muscle because it has a name quadratus. Then the one immediately above that is very thin. That's the inferior gemellus. Then you have your op obturator internus, which is just that tendon. Then superior gemellus. And just above that, you'll have the piriformis and the sciatic nerve will just run in, in between like that. But as I say, it's right in the middle of the buttock crease and it's at about a 45 degree angle uh, heading, heading off towards midline. Okay. And then my landmarks, Thanks. yeah. Terrific. Okay, um, I think we've got our, our final question because we, we're just about at, at time. Um, and it's from Jenny and it's a really good one actually. Um, how do you position your patients to scan their hamstrings? Yes, very good question. Um, I get them to lie flat on their stomach, which is great. Um, now, if they, if, you know, that's fine. And then you, uh, then you scan away because you've, you know, you've got the, the posterior part of your, the thigh facing upwards. And most patients can actually do that. Uh, that's not too hard at all. Uh, if they really can't lie on their stomach, then I will do them lying on their, um, on their side with the affected side up, obviously. And um, then I can scan them on their side like that. But usually just lying, you know, prone. Um, some people put a bit of a, um, a, a pad under the, uh, the leg to flex the knee just to try and take some of the pressure off the, off the hamstring. But I find just lying them prone and um, scanning up and down. But yeah, you can do them on the side uh, if necessary. So there's no, there's no, no, nothing, nothing to compel you to need to put the feet over the side of the bed because you actually want a little, a little bit of flexion yeah, in the knee. Bit, yeah, I mean, no, yeah, I don't. But you know, there could be other people yeah. who say, "Oh no, I was feet hanging there." No, I don't. Yeah. And 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 look, and if a patient has problems with their um, uh, hamstring, you know, they aren't going to want to really extend their hamstring all the way. They're not going to want to have their knee fully extended because even doing that now on myself, oh, I can feel it. So if you have then these just that little bit flex, it's going to take that pressure off their hamstring. It's going to feel much more comfortable for them. Terrific. Okay. And thanks everybody for asking questions. We really appreciate yeah, right. that. I just thought we'd take the last little bit of the webinar just to um, talk about some events that are coming up and particularly with you, Andrew. Oh, yes. Um, and I've even got um, flash... Uh, Things. So this coming up this Saturday, we uh, Canon are sponsoring an ASA travelling workshop. Um, there's still spots left. I don't know if there's going to be too many people who want to get from uh, uh, New Zealand to to Hobart, but you never know. But uh, we might have a few Taswegian attendees on. Um, it's so Andrew, it's very close. It's very close. It's very close. But um, great event coming up there at at Royal Hobart Hospital. It is um, also to. Oops, I've gone one ahead. Let me go one back. Um, of course, we've got ASA 2024 coming up. Um, Canon Medical happened to be a gold partner of that, which we're very proud, proud to do, but also too, Andrew's gonna be there doing some live um, workshops and lectures. So Friday, you've got brachial plexus. I know that Saturday, you're in the Canon workshop room to do breast elastography and Sunday, as part of a really big men's health program, you're doing the, sc the scrotum lecture. Yes, yes, I'll be there with um, uh, Stephen Bird and uh, Peter Coombs and a urologist, I think. So that'll be that'll be a great session. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, that's correct. It will be a good session. And of course, um, if anybody is going to ASA 2024, um, seek out Andrew. If you've got more questions about today, yeah. that's no problem at all. More than happy um, to talk to people. Fantastic. And um, I mentioned earlier in the program about last year's New Zealand Anatomy Weekend. Um, we've got two Anatomy Days coming up this year, um, one in Sydney, and I've got the auto, auto change going. One is in Sydney, and that's going to be with um, Stephen Bird and Andrew Grant. That's going to be on the nervous system on Saturday, the 26th of October 2024. The other one will be the Gold Coast Anatomy Day, which will be coming up in August, 17th of August, and that will be with Stephen Bird and Aaron Fleming. Tickets will actually be on sale in mid-May. We're planning on releasing both um, Anatomy Days in mid-May. Um, also too, for Canon Medical, our next um, 
webinar will be the Art of Breast Ultrasound. It's going to be on um, Wednesday, May 15th, and it's going to be with Cindy Rapp from um, Canon Medical USA. Um, she's a, a ultrasound educator and breast ultrasound expert. Um, so yes. details will be coming out for that very soon. Um, just while we're finishing up, thank you very much, Fran, and the team in New Zealand, Grant Campbell, Mike Sedells for everything. Also wanted to thank um, our marketing division, Dana Lee and Tara Shaw. Also to all the team in Australia for getting the word out. Thank you to Andrew for getting the word out with your with your workplace. So I want to thank finally um, our big boss, Jason Cotter, for making all this happen. We really do appreciate that. And um, friend, is there anything you wanted to say? Um, I, I know quite a few people seem to have some technical problems, but um, mm. it, they will definitely be able to um, to watch the webinar. And if people have any problems with getting the link for the webinar, they're always welcome to drop me a line. Terrific. Thank you very much. Thanks, friend. So finally, just want to thank uh, everybody for joining the call. It's a really good um, presentation, and I do highly recommend watching the the lecture again. It, there's lots of great information. There's a lot coming at you. And also to um, thank you so much, Andrew, for your um, presentation and Q&A and your sharing your expertise with you. We really do appreciate that. And we'll, we'll catch you soon at other events. Thanks, everybody. Thanks again, Brett. Thanks, no Brett. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, Brett. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, everyone.